University of the Witwatersrand has resumed participation in the Oxford COVID-19 vaccine trial currently underway. Now, the trials were suspended when one participant in the UK experienced what officials call a medical event. Now, details of that incident can't be divulged due to patient confidentiality. Professor of Vaccinology with the University of Witwatersrand, Shabi Mari, joining us now to talk about where we go from here. Prof, a very good morning and thanks once again for your time. So we understand that you can't tell us uh, the details of, of what you're calling a medical event but are you able to give us a, a, a sort of uh, uh, just an idea of, of what that could include or what it might include when when doctors and professors say a medical event and was it actually related to the vaccine trial to to what was uh, injected into this person uh, so good morning to you so you as you mentioned uh, if we were to mention exactly what the diagnosis is there is a risk of the privacy of the individual being compromised. So unfortunately, we can't pronounce on the exact medical condition. What we're able to tell is that uh, the Independent Data and Safety Monitoring Board reviewed this particular medical event, uh, taking together the totality of evidence in relation to investigations that was done for this individual. And the conclusion of the Independent Data and Safety Monitoring Board was that this medical event was unlikely to be related to vaccination. Mm -hmm. I guess I should also just uh, emphasize that this is not something that is unique to COVID-19 uh, vaccines. This is a common occurrence that occurs during phase one and phase two studies of many experimental interventions. When something arises that might not that might be con that might potentially be related to the intervention, it's not uncommon for the data and safety monitoring boards to put a hold in terms of further vaccination or further use of that intervention until they can establish with a reasonable degree of certainty that the event was not associated with the intervention. So what can you tell us about the condition of this participant now? So that's, uh, fortunately, this participant has recovered. Uh, from what I gather, the participant has actually been uh, released from hospital. Uh, the event that the participant experienced is something which is also commonly caused by other what we call enteroviruses. Uh, and that could possibly have been a reason. But this particular uh, individual has uh, recovered, uh, at least has been discharged from hospital. All right, so we understand that the trials adverts are getting underway again. They have resumed. What can you tell us about progress then on that front? How close are we? I suppose everyone, uh, Prof, is kind of anxious to know, seeing as they might be able to travel just a little bit further now. But this is key to that, I suppose. Yeah, well, unfortunately, the bad news is that it's unlikely that the general public are going to gain access to a vaccine at least till the middle of next year, at least not in South Africa, unfortunately. Uh, in terms of the clinical trial itself, uh, where we're standing currently is that we've enrolled about 1,850 of the targeted 2,000 participants. One of the curveballs that we've experienced in the South African study, which is good news for South Africa, coincidentally, is that there has been a decrease in terms of the amount of transmission of the virus. And for these sorts of studies to actually determine whether the vaccine protects against COVID-19 or not, unfortunately, we do require uh, some of the participants to develop COVID-19 before we can do that sort of an analysis. So it's unlikely that we'll be able to do that any time in the next few months, uh, simply because of the decline of the transmission of the virus in South Africa. Well, I suppose even if and when, you know, we, we, we do get our hands on that vaccine, if and when it, it does come out, it's still not an absolute answer to everything, is it? Because, I mean, yes, it's there, but it doesn't mean we can just go about our lives as, uh, as we did before COVID-19. Sure, and it all, it's all an issue about the quantity of vaccine that will be available. Obviously, the entire world probably needs, needs close on to uh, 12, 10 billion doses of vaccine if the adult population needs to receive two doses of each of the vaccines, which is unlikely to be available. So, unfortunately, we face a situation where we will need to have some level of prioritization mm. as to who would gain access at an early stage to the vaccine. But for the rest of us, we pretty much would need to be taking some level of precautions to minimize the risk mm. of acquiring the virus if we haven't already been infected, as well as transmitting it to other susceptible individuals. Well, 
I'm, prof I, I, I'm hoping that maybe you can allay some panic or worry over this issue. Last week I did an interview with Oxfam. They were very concerned uh, uh, about uh, rich countries and just a handful of them who they say have monopolized uh, sort of the, uh, the vaccine when it comes out and, 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 you know, sort of booked it up, I suppose, for, for their countries and they make up a very small part of the world's population, fearing that the poor, poorer countries are not going to have or get easy access to this. Just your understanding of, of how this process, and we understand that the COVID COVAX, the, the UN's COVAX process is also underway to make sure there's equitable distribution of a vaccine. Where does, should we worry in South Africa that, that we might be left by the wayside when this happens? Well, I think because of the COVAX facility, are we fortunate in that if South Africa does actually sign up to the COVAX facility, we won't be left completely at the wayside. But that doesn't negate uh, the reality that there is vaccine nationalism that has emerged from countries such as the United States, United Kingdom, a few other European countries, as well as uh, outside of Europe, where these countries have put billions of dollars uh, onto the table uh, to basically procure vaccines, which we don't even know whether these vaccines would work or not. But the COVAX facility does provide some level of opportunity to sort of, I wouldn't say level the field, because it's still going to be biased in terms of the buying purchasing power of the high income countries. But it at least provides a framework that would enable low middle income countries to be able to access vaccine at a relatively early stage. But for countries such as South Africa to benefit from that, they would need to sign up to that facility and actually put the money up front into the facility so that they can procure vaccine for at least 20% of the population at an early stage of its availability. And what's our ability to do that at the moment, if you're privy to that information? Uh, well, unfortunately, I'm not part of the National Department of Health, and they would be the ones that would need to comment on that. All right. Thanks very much for that, Professor Shabir Mahdi, for that Inside Vaccine Trials resuming there uh, at Wits University.